You know, it never ceases to amaze me how our Heavenly Father just dovetails everything together at these meetings. Ever since I've been coming here and speaking, the speaker's subjects have all dovetailed together. And the music, and it's just like, this is incredible. Um, we don't plan this, you know. God's the one that does it. This, this subject on the 144,000, basically, I did it um, I, about 20 years ago is when God revealed a lot of this information to me from the Old Testament. And I put it together, and I was just elated because <laughs> it was all new to me. And um, ever since I started coming here, I, every year I'd say, well, Lord, what do I speak on this time? Is it the 144,000? Not until this spring. And you know what that tells me? We're getting close. Because he knows when we need this information. And he knows when his people need to be getting ready. And we don't have much time left. So anyway, um, let's bow for prayer. Our most kind, gracious Heavenly Father, again, we just praise you and thank you for what you are doing for us for your leading and guiding, for only you know. And we are just your children to follow where you guide us. And this morning we want to thank you for everyone here, for blessing us with truth and understanding. And please open up our, our, our mind of understanding to grasp the truths that you have for us today and that we will live for you and to honor you in all that we do and say. Please watch over us. May your holy angels protect and drive back all the evil forces that may be trying to influence anyone in any way. We want just your Holy Spirit's sweet influence in our lives. And we thank you and praise you in Yeshua's name. Amen. I've talked to several people while here and they said this is one of their favorite subjects and it has always been my favorite subject as well as since I was just a very young girl I thought wow 144,000 <laughs> they have to be special who are they and um, anyway it was a very unique way how God got me to, to do this but I don't have time to tell that but uh, it was incredible because I sure didn't just come up with this Okay, and I saw another angel ascend from the east, having the seal of the living God, and I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. This setting in Revelation is at the time of the end. But to understand who the 144,000 are and their very important role that they are chosen for, we need to go back, way back to the beginning the book of Genesis, where lies the foundation of all scripture. In Genesis 25, we read the story of Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, who was pregnant with twins. And the children struggled together within her, and she went to inquire the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the elder shall serve the younger. This indicated that Jacob, rather than Esau, was to become inheritor of the birthright, title to the family name, and a double portion of his father's inheritance. What was the birthright? Rights or privileges belonged to the firstborn son. To succeed his father as the head of the family, that's the priest, inherit a double portion of his father's property, a prince. The birthright also carried with it a financial blessing. It is apparent from Old Testament accounts that all these gifts and privileges could be forfeited as the case of Esau, who sold his birthright to Jacob, or in the experience of Reuben, who lost his right through misconduct. The birthright is related to the order of birth of sons. The firstborn son was given the title to the family name and a double portion of his father's inheritance. In this case, Esau foolishly gave in to Jacob's extortion and sold his birthright to Jacob. Yet despite Jacob's wickedness and Esau's foolishness, 
the agreement over the birthright was binding. Esau had already sold his birthright to Jacob. Jacob was now seeking to secure Isaac's financial blessing as well, which would additionally constitute an acknowledgement of Jacob's possession of the birthright. Jacob realized that once the blessing had been given, it could not be withdrawn. The blessing... Isaac believed that he was blessing his firstborn son Esau, and he said, Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be every one that curses thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. This blessing pronounced the future prosperity of Jacob in possession of the promised land given to Abraham and Isaac. The dew as a source of blessing is indispensable to the growth of the fruit of the earth. The phrase, thy let people serve thee, made Jacob preeminent, not only over his brethren and relatives, but over foreign people as well. This blessing, blessing envisioned the concept of universal domain which was indeed God's original plan for Israel. Esau's defective character disqualified him from receiving the blessing. He coveted the blessing without any intentions of accepting the obligation that went with it. He forfeited forever the privileges of family leadership due to the firstborn. While God had previously recognized Jacob to be in the line of promise, he did not approve of Jacob's conduct. Jacob's scheming bore terrible fruits throughout his life. He had to flee for his life from his brother, who desired revenge and live in fear of Esau for years, and he never saw his mother again. When Jacob fled from his home, he went to live and work for his uncle Laban, and on his way there he had a dream. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and on top of it reached to heaven, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, the father, and the God of Jacob. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Yah himself reassured Jacob that he was with him and would honor and bless him that Isaac pronounced upon him. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken of thee. Jacob deceived. Jacob had fallen in love with Laban's daughter Rachel. An arrangement had been made for Jacob to work seven years for his uncle Laban, And then he would give Rachel to Jacob to be his wife. But Jacob was tricked by his uncle Laban. And at the end of seven years, Jacob was given Rachel's older sister Leah to marry instead. And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he, Jacob, said to Laban, What is this thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? And Laban said, It must not be so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Laban told Jacob that if he would work seven more years, then he would give him Rachel as well. So Jacob fulfilled her, or Leah's week, and he, Laban, gave him Rachel, his daughter, to wife also. Jacob's twelve sons. And he, Jacob, loved also Rachel more than Leah. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, He opened her womb, and Rachel was barren. (coughs) Leah called her first son Reuben, which means see a son. The Lord has seen my afflictions. Leah's second son she called Simeon, which means hearing. The Lord hath heard and answered my prayer. And Leah's third son she called Levi, which means joined. My husband will be joined unto me. Fourth son, Judah, means praise. Let God be praised, or I will praise the Lord. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, she said, Behold, my maid, 
Bila, go into her, and she shall bear upon my knees, and I that I may have children also. Um, Bila conceived and bare Jacob a son, and Rachel named him Dan, which means judged. God hath judged me. And, and Bila conceived again and bare Jacob a second son. And Rachel named him Naphtali, means wrestling. With great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed. When Leah saw that she had left bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her Jacob to wife, and Zilpah bore Jacob a son. <coughs> and Leah named him Gad, which means troop. A troop or com- company cometh. And Zilpah bare Jacob a second son, and Leah called his name Asher, which means happy. Happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed. And Leah conceived and bare Jacob a fifth son and named him Issachar, which means reward. God hath given me my hire or reward. Leah's sixth sixth son, Zebulun, means to dwell. God hath given me a fine gift. Now will my husband dwell with me. Quite a battle going on, wasn't it? Afterwards, she, Leah, bare a daughter and called her name Diana, Justice. And God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bare a son and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, which means adding. The Lord shall add to me another son. May God give increase. And Rachel travailed, and <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and she was in hard labor. The midwife said unto her, "Fear not, thou shalt have this son also." And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Ben Onai, that is, son of my sorrow. But his father called him Benjamin, son of my right hand, son of my strength. Excuse me, I'll get get a drink here. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. The night of wrestling. After Jacob had fulfilled his fourteen years of labor for his uncle Laban, the angel of God spake unto Jacob and said, I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar, and where thou vowedest a vow unto me. Now arise, get thee out from this land, and return into the land of thy kindred. We all remember the story of the fear and distress which Jacob experienced because of his troubled conscience concerning the great sin of deceiving his father years before, as well as the fear of the approach of his brother with 400 men remembering how Esau swore to kill him. <clears throat> the night Jacob spent in wrestling with the angel of the Lord, Yeshua, and how he prevailed with Yah and won the victory. The error that had led to Jacob's sin in obtaining the birthright by fraud was now clearly set before him. He had not trusted God's promises, but had sought by his own efforts to bring about that which God would have accomplished in his own time and way. As it evidenced that he had been forgiven, his name was changed from one that was a reminder of his sin to one that commemorated his victory. Thy name, said the angel, shall be called no more Jacob, the supplanter, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and has prevailed. Jacob had received the blessing for which his soul had longed. His sin as a supplanter and deceiver had been pardoned. The crisis in his life was past. Doubt, perplexity, and remorse had bittered his existence. But now all was changed, and sweet was the peace of reconciliation with God. Jacob no longer feared to meet his brother. Jacob's prophecy of his twelve sons. Although Jacob had wrestled with God and prevailed, His dishonesty had affected his children. When Jacob was old and ready to die, he called all his sons in to his bedside and said, 
Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Although the characters of his son formed the starting point of his prophecies concerning them, the Spirit of God revealed to the dying patriarch the future history of his seed so that he discerned in the character of his sons the future development of the tribes descending from them. To each he assigned its position and importance in the nation with unerring prophetic insight. Reuben my first son, you are my strength. Your birth showed I could be a father. You have the highest position among my sons, and you are the most powerful. But you are uncontrollable like water, so you, know, so you will no longer lead your brothers. This is because you got into your father's bed and shamed me by having sexual relations with my slave girl. The advantages normally occurring to Reuben as Jacob's firstborn were to be taken from him because of his weakness of character. The word translated unstable, literally a boiling over of water, implies figuratively giving into one's emotions, frivolity, and pride. Jacob thus described the moral weakness of Reuben's character by which he forfeited the privilege of as a firstborn. This basic weakness disqualified him from becoming a leader, for leadership often calls for firmness and determination. By his unworthy character, Reuben lost the birthright blessing to three of his younger brothers. The priesthood was assigned to Levi. The crowning blessing of the birthright of the kingdom and the messianic promise of Judah to Judah and the double portion of the inheritance to Joseph which he received through his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, Simeon and Levi. Brothers who used their swords to do violence, they killed men because they were angry. May their anger be cursed because it is too violent. May their violence be cursed because it is too cruel. I will divide them up among the tribes of Jacob and scatter them through all the tribes of Israel. Jacob now explains while the next two oldest sons, Simeon and Levi, were also unworthy to succeed Reuben as rulers. These two brothers had joined together in the cruel massacre of the men of Shechem in revenge for the humiliation of their sister Dinah. Since they had committed this crime jointly, their posterity was to be divided or scattered in Canaan. They would not constitute independent tribes. Their weakness of character include cruelty, wrath, anger, outburst of passion, and murder. Notice that Jacob condemned their cruelty and the anger, but not his two sons. Moses and Aaron and the great prophets, Samuel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Hosea, and John the Baptist, were from the tribe of Levi. Judah, your brothers will praise you. You will grab your enemies by the neck, and your brothers will bow down to you. Judah is like a lion, and no one is brave enough to wake him. <coughs> Kings will come from Judah's family. Someone from Judah will always be on the throne. Judah will rule until Shiloh comes, and the nations will obey him. Jacob's fourth son was the first to receive a rich and unqualified qualified blessing one which bestowed upon him supremacy and power. Jacob assured Judah of the praise of his brethren. Judah had shown a noble character, even in the dark hour when Joseph's brothers were plotting to kill him. Judah had pro uh, proposed a solution that saved Joseph's life. The excellency of his character was illustrated, moreover, in the offering of his own life as a pledge for that of Benjamin, and also when he pleaded with Joseph on Benjamin's behalf to save him from slavery. His own personal strength of character acquired by stern victories over natural tendencies was reflected, reflected in the virility of the tribe that bore his name. By a bold figure of speech, Judah is compared to a young lion growing up into the full strength and ferocity of an old lion. 
Judah was to continue as leader among the tribes until the time of the coming of the Messiah. Shiloh, therefore, is the Messiah, who in Jacob's prophecy was to take over Judah's royal prerogatives as leader of Israel and to whom all nations would gather. Jesus and David were descendants from the tribe of Judah. Zebulun. Zebulun shall dwell or lodge at the haven of the sea, and he shall be for a haven of ships. Haven is to cover or shelter, and his borders shall be unto Zidon. Issachar. Issachar is like a strong donkey who lies down while carrying his load. When he sees his resting place is good and how pleasant his land is, he will put his back to the load and become a slave. The comparison of Issachar to a strong-built donkey adapted for carrying burdens would point to the fact that they would be developed to agriculture and not political power. They would be men of strength and would receive a pleasant inheritance. This also reflects Issachar's spiritual role as bearer of the yoke of Torah and cultivator of the spiritual treasures of the people. 200 head of Sanhedrin came from this tribe. Many of this tribe also had the understanding of the times. Dan. Dan will avenge his people. The tribes of Israel will be as one. Dan will be a serpent on the highway, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider falls backward. For your salvation do I long, O Hashem. Dan is the tribe of judgment, determination and directing truth and power to the Jewish people. He is likened to a snake who bites the horse's heels and has cunning methods to overcome his enemy, such as Samson, who was a Danite and judged Israel for 20 years and who, with the cunningness of a serpent, overthrew his strongest foes. The exalted position of Dan is in great contrast to the depths to which he afterwards fell. For he settled among the heathen. Since the tribe of Dan seems to have been the first to introduce idol worship into Israel, and since his character would not qualify anyone for admission into the heavenly Canaan, The name of Dan among the twelve tribes is omitted from their enumeration in Revelation 7. Gad. A troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at last. The language seems to refer to attacks that the tribe of Gad would have to endure with patience, but that they would successfully repel. Jacob predicted that Gad's descendants would be hard-pressed by hostile forces, but would stand against them. They were a courageous tribe and compared to a lion. It is believed that Elijah came from this tribe. Asher. His bread will have richness, and he will provide kingly delicacies. Asher's land will be so rich in olive groves that it will flow with oil like a fountain and he will provide kingly delicacies. His rich produce will be worthy of royal tables and will be sought by kings. Naphtali is a hind hind let loose who delivers beautiful sayings. Its crops will ripen swiftly like a hind or a deer let loose to run free. Naphtali's beautiful praises to God in gratitude for the abundant crops. Joseph. Joseph is like a grapevine that produces much fruit, a healthy vine watered by a spring whose branches grow over the wall. Archers attack him violently and shoot at him angrily, but he aims his bow well. His arms are made strong. He gets his power from the mighty God of Jacob and his strength from the shepherd, the rock of Israel. The blessings of your father are greater than the blessings of the oldest mountains, greater than the good things of the long-lasting hills. May these blessings rest on the head of Joseph, on the forehead of one who was separated from his brethren. This prophecy comparing Joseph to a prolific vine or tree growing by a spring would refer to Joseph's offspring, 
the fruitfulness of Ephraim and Manasseh, surpassing the blessings of his father Jacob. From the symbolism of the fruit tree, Jacob passed next to one of war, describing the victory of the tribe of Joseph over all its foes, and to the persecution, slavery, and imprisonment they will suffer at the hands of others. Joseph rose to prominence despite the hatred he suffered. His brothers and Potiphar and his wife all embittered him and became antagonists. People with arrow-like tongues of malicious slander and gossip dealt bitterly with Joseph. But by the grace of God, he rose to prominence despite them. When Joseph was tempted, his heart remained with God and he overcame his desires. When Joseph needed God's help to maintain his spiritual integrity, and in the future, when Israel cries out to him, as Joseph did in the time of his spiritual anguish, God will provide sufficient blessings for the people to prevail. Joseph is referred to, literally, as the one, the separated one. Benjamin. Benjamin is like a hungry wolf. In the morning, he eats what he has caught, and in the evening, he divides what he has taken. Benjamin's descendants, likened to a wolf, were mighty, fearless warriors and will triumph over Israel's enemies and divide the spoil of victory. This is an allusion to Mordecai and Esther of the tribe of Benjamin who defeated Haman and were awarded his estate. King Saul and the Apostle Paul were from the tribe of Benjamin. Both were fearless warriors. The two sons of Joseph. Jacob said unto Joseph, Your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, will be counted as my own sons. The blessing included a major change in the composition of the Jewish people in that Jacob elevated Manasseh and Ephraim to the status of his own sons, in effect adopting them as his own, whereby removing the firstborn status from the tribe of Reuben and giving it to Joseph's offspring, Manasseh. Manasseh will be great and have many descendants. The name Manasseh means forgetting or making to forget. God has caused me to forget all my toils or hardships and all my father's house or household. Manasseh was the firstborn of Joseph's two sons, and even though his younger brother was to become superior, he too would become a great nation. The great warrior Gideon was a descendant from this tribe. Ephraim. Ephraim shall be great, Greater and his seed or descendants shall become a multitude of nations. The name Ephraim means double fruitness, fruitfulness. For God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction or suffering. Assuring Joseph that Manasseh, the elder of the two, would also become a great nation, Jacob stated emphatically, however, that Ephraim would become even greater a multitude of nations, or more literally, a fullness of nations. The great warrior Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim. Mount Sinai, we're kind of jumping ahead a ways here. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. And Moses went up to the mountain to meet with Elohim, and the Lord said to him, Thus shalt thou say unto the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I have done unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice, indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and of holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do, 
And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. The golden calf. Once again, Moses is called by Yah up to the mountain to receive all the laws. His extended absence made the Israelites restless and impatient. With their leader gone, a reaction set in, and the flesh triumphed over the spirit. The people then demanded of Aaron, Make us gods. The Lord gave to Moses Moses the two tables of stone and said, Go, get thee down, for thy people have corrupted themselves. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it. And it came to pass, as soon as he, Moses, came nigh into camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the two tables out of his hand and brake them. And he took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and shrewed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. Among the heathen, such dances were of a loose and lascivious character. It was this type of dancing that the Israelites now indulged. It was idolatry at its worst. To a large extent, the spirit of apostasy was generated by the mixed multitude who had joined the Israelites to escape the plagues of Egypt. They were a constant hindrance and a snare to Israel. The people were given free reign to their wild passion. Moral restraint had been completely abandoned. It was not strange that he, Moses, cast the two tables violently upon the ground and break them. By this he indicated that they had broken their covenant with God. Here we see the mirror image of where the professed church of God is today. With what seems to be a delay in Christ's coming, his church has lost their vision, become lukewarm, mixed with the idol worshipers and joining in with the heathen in in worldly pleasures. This is the spirit of apostasy. They have broken their covenant with Yah, and a line is about to be drawn in the sand. The Choosing of the Tribe of Levi Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp, that's the east side, and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me, or join me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. The name Levi means to join or to unite. The tribe of Levi made a choice and joined with Moses to stand on the Lord's side. Along, alone among their brethren, the son of Levi rallied to the Lord's side. They had not participated in the idolatrous worship. Then Moses said to them, The Lord, the God of Israel, says this, Every man must put on his sword and go through the camp from one end to the other. Each man must kill his brother, his friend, and his neighbor. God said that the overt idolaters must be executed. Moses now commanded the Levites to kill the the guilty parties, regardless of who they were, even if it meant that they would have to execute close relatives. The tribe of Levi obeyed Moses, and that day about 3,000 died. Then Moses said, Today you, the tribe of Levi, have been given for service to the Lord. You were willing to kill your own sons and brothers, and God has blessed you for this. Does this command sound harsh to you? Does this seem to go contrary to the character of Yah? Why did a loving God order the tribe of Levi to do such an act against their family and friends? The Israelites had been guilty of treason and that against a king who had loaded them with benefits and whose authority they had voluntarily pledged themselves to obey. That the divine government might be maintained, justice must be visited upon the traitors. Only those who were cut off, who perished in rebellion. God is the guardian as well as the sovereign of his people. He cuts off those who are determined upon rebellion that they may not lead others to ruin. Do you see the wisdom? He wasn't being cruel. 
they, the, the, those tribes are the ones that made their own choice. Wherever the Levites saw that any still persisting in the licentious riots, riots, they were to slay them with the sword, ignoring every tie of family and friendship. Resolute action was necessary to quell rebellion. How would this apply to us today? When we give our baptismal vows, are not we making the same commitment today as did the Israelites of old? Um, Israelites to obey all that Yah had commanded? Or are we joining in the rebellion with the mixed multitude in their worshiping of other gods? How serious are we taking our vows to Yah? Will this scene of slaughter of the rebellious be repeated? Maybe it would be well for us to reread Ezekiel chapter 9. Does this slain of the rebellious with the sword by the Levites have its symbolism in Yah's church today? What did Yeshua say about himself? Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. For I am, not come, for I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foe shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. What did Yeshua mean that he came to bring differences between family members? Is it when truth is spoken, spoken some will accept it and some will refuse it? One cannot be forced to believe truth. It must be a choice. Thus it brings differences into the home and church. But there is no union between the prince of light and the prince of darkness, and there can be no union between their followers. When Christians consented to unite with those who were but half converted from paganism, they entered upon a path which led further and further from the truth. These half-converted pagans were the mixed multitude who led out in this rebellion and caused many of the Israelites to perish. The same goes for Yah's people today. So how should we deal with this issue? Speaking of the early Christian church, we read, After a long and severe conflict, the faithful few decided to dissolve all union with the apostate church if she still refused to free herself from falsehood and idolatry. They saw that separation was an absolute necessity if they would obey the word of God. They dared not tolerate error, errors fatal to their own souls and set an example which would imperil the faith of their children and children's children. To secure peace and unity, they were ready to make any concession consistent with fidelity to God. But they felt that even peace would be too dearly purchased at the sacrifice of principle. If unity would be secured only by the compromise of truth and righteousness, then let there be difference and even war. To preserve Yah's church, truth and obedience must prevail over unity. The sword today in which the rebellious will be slain is the word of God. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intent of the heart. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. Yah's people are not to mingle nor join with those who persist in rebellion against him and his word. Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsels of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. The Levitical Priesthood After the sons of Levi chose to stand for Yah and slew those in rebellion, Moses said to them, Dedicate or consecrate yourself this day to Hashem, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. The Hebrew word for consecration carries with it the idea of being ordained to a hot, holy office. Here it implies also the special blessing God had in store for the Levites, the honor of being chosen to serve in the sanctuary. 
The Levites had separated themselves from the other tribes in response to Moses' call to take his stand for God in the midst of apostasy. In character, they were separated from their brethren. By virtue of their own choice, now, by virtue of God's choice, they were separated to his service. From this time on, Yah chose the tribe of Levi as his own rather than the firstborn. Thus shalt thou separate the Levites from among the children of Israel, and the Levites shall be mine, for they are wholly given unto me from among the children of Israel. Instead of the firstborn of all the children of Israel, have I taken them unto me. That's impressive. Do you want to be one of those? Me too. (laughs) By their courage and loyalty, the Levites earned the right to replace the firstborn and be designated as God's chosen tribe, which would serve him in the temple. Before any of the Levites could serve in the sanctuary, they first had to be consecrated to Yah, starting with those who who were to serve in the highest office of the priesthood. And thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them, and they shall, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. The consecration of Aaron's and sons. And Moses brought Aaron's sons and put coats upon them, that's a covering, shield of faith, and girded them with girdles, that's a belt or armor, loins girded about with truth, and put bonnets on them, That's the head covering, the helmet of salvation. And he brought the ram of consecration, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the ram. And he slew it, and Moses took of the blood of it and put it upon the tip of Aaron's right ear, consecration to hear and understand Yah's truth, and the thumb of his right hand, consecrated to do Yah's service, and upon the great toe of his right foot, consecrated to walk in Yah's ways. Moses repeated the same process of consecration on Aaron's sons. If we desire to have the character of Yeshua and reflect his image, we too must first consecrate our whole being to Yah to hear his spirit as he speaks to us through his word. We then obey his voice, do his works, and walk in his ways. By this we are washing our robes, our characters, in the cleansing blood of Yeshua, which was the final step of this consecration of Aaron and his son that sanctified them or pronounced them as clean. And Moses took of the anointing oil and of the blood which was upon the altar and sprinkled it upon Aaron and upon his garments and upon his sons and upon his son's garments with him and sanctified Aaron and his garments, his sons and his son's garments with him. The same ritual of consecration and cleansing for the high priest Aaron was done also for his sons. If we're going to follow the Lamb in heaven, we must first follow him here on earth. Consecrating the tribe of Levi. How blessed and privileged among all the other tribes were the Levites to be chosen, appointed, and consecrated as the servants of the sanctuary of Jehovah. To receive their new status as the substitute for the firstborn, the Levites required a ritual of consecration, as did Aaron and his sons. This ritual was to be performed by Levi before they entered upon their solemn duties. Hashem spoke to Moses, saying, Take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them, and thus shalt thou do unto them to cleanse them. Sprinkle water of purifying upon them, and let them shave all their flesh, and let them wash their clothes, and so make themselves clean. This water of purifying simply means water that washes away transgression. And the Levites were purified, and Aaron made an atonement for them to cleanse them. Or were purified literally means unsinned, referring to the personal preparation required and not the ceremonial sprinkling. The next step of consecration was to bring all the Levites to the front of the tabernacle before the Lord and the whole assembly of the children of Israel, where they would lay hands upon the Levites. The Levites, who had replaced the firstborn, were tantamount or equivalent in value to offerings for the nation. So it was appropriate for the people to lean or place their hands on the head of the Levite as one does with his offering. After the laying on of the hands, then Aaron shall offer or weigh the Levites before the Lord for an offering to the children of Israel, or excuse me, an offering of the children of Israel, that they may execute the service of the Lord. 
The waving of the Levites, that means presenting them as an offering, also represented this status as symbolic offerings. In other words, the Levites became a living sacrifice for the service of Yah. Thus shalt thou separate the Levites from among the children of Israel, and the Levites shall be mine. And after that shall the Levites go into the service of the tabernacle, the congregation, and thou shalt cleanse them and offer them for an offering. For they are, they are wholly given unto me among, from among the children of Israel, and I have taken the Levites from, for all the firstborn of the children of Israel. And I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and his sons from among the children of Israel to do the service of the children of Israel in the tabernacle of the congregation and to make an atonement for the children of Israel. The Levites as a living offering for the service of the Most High also applies to Yah's true people today. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'm going to have to stop here, I think. <laughs> we will continue here tomorrow because I'm running out of time. And I just read as fast as I could. <laughs> Shall we bow for a closing prayer? Our most kind, gracious Father in heaven, we just want to thank you so much for your word, which every word that's in scripture has meaning for us. And all these stories that you have given us, all the types that were before us, that we our eyes will be open so that we can see their meaning for us now. Dear Lord, please send your Holy Spirit to guide and direct our thoughts and understanding and bless us throughout the remainder of this day that we may bring honor and glory to your name. In Yeshua's name and for his sake we ask it. Amen.